Hvernig er framhaldi á þínum landsinsferli? Ég er... Hann sér hættur um að... Þetta er verið síðast í rosti. Den nya törde var en gråtande Eidur Gudjonsson som efter playoff-förlusten mot Kroatien hösten 2013 meddelade att han förmodligen gjort sin sista match för det isländska landslaget. Sedan 1996 hade han krigat som en ganska ensam stjärna från den lilla önnationen men aldrig tidigare kommit så nära ett mästerskap som han och Island var där i Zagreb och nu var det slut. Trodde alla, men ödet och Lars Lagerbäck ville annorlunda. We'll give it away here to Johan Berg Gudmundsson. And here's Ida Gudjonsson! Oh, can you believe it? Can you believe it? Back he comes! And he scores his 25th goal after 18 months away from the national team. I mars 2005 var Islands enda riktiga superstjärna tillbaka i landslaget efter att ha blivit övertalad av Lars Lagerbäck och han fick ta del av den otroliga resan som nu lett hela vägen fram till EM i Frankrike. I den här podden berättar Eidor Gudjonsson bland annat om varför Lars Lagerbäck lyckats ta lilla Island hela vägen till EM. Vad han har är något speciellt. Det är en presens när han går in the door. Yes. Everyone sits up when he walks in, and uh, and one of the best attributes of a coach is is the ones who can get their message over to the players most clearly. And he, he definitely does that. Och utöver att ge sin syn på Lars Lagerbäck så ger även Eidor Gudjonsson sin bild av två andra stjärntränare som han spelat under. Mourinho loves confrontation, but Guardiola does. He hides away from it and doesn't want it. Eidor Gudjonsson berättar även om hur det var att komma till Barcelona som ersättare till Henrik Larsson och att han inte helt kände sig bekväm med att ständigt jämföras med sin svenska företrädare. And with full respect to Henry Glasson, it's uh, I had no problem with it, but it's not nice when people are comparing you because we are completely different players and completely different characters. Och som vanligt börjar vi på den med en fakta ute och där jag svarar på några av frågorna eftersom det var begränsat med tid med Islands superstjärna. Eidor Gudrunsson är 37 år. Han har fru och fyra barn och frun och de tre yngsta barnen bor i Barcelona. En son spelar fotboll på Island. Själv bor han i Molde för tillfället och spelar för Molde. Och hans lön, ja det är en väl förborgad hemlighet. Men hans olika transfers genom karriären har nått upp till ungefär en kvarts miljard kronor. Which is the best player you've played with? It has to be Messi. And because uh, I think I don't, don't need to explain why. He's just something extraordinary. Which title? You've won a lot of titles. Which title is the biggest that you've won? The, the one that I cherish the most is the first Premier League title with Chelsea because we were a group of players who had been together for four five seasons and uh, it was finally the moment for us to make that step not only playing at a good club but becoming champions together which is the the biggest thing you've uh, experienced with football probably el clasico is uh, is the biggest game in in league football anywhere in the world I think so that's probably the biggest thing best coach you've had Mourinho I guess you have a favorite team which is it my favorite team uh, I'm I'm a Chelsea boy I was uh, Chelsea is more than a, just a football club to me. 
what's happiness for you? Being healthy. Which living person do you admire? Many. Mm. My wife. Which talent would you like to have? Musical. Your favorite swear word? Uh, F. Starts with an F. <laughs> and ends when you say K. Uh. If the if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive? Welcome. Och då var det dags för sporten och Axel och du börjar med en historisk Lars Lagerbäck. Stämmer bra det Soraya, för Island är ju klart för EM nästa sommar efter 0-0 hemma mot Kazakstan. Och när slutsignalen gick så jublade hela ön, eller i alla fall nästan. Förbundskaptenen Lars Lagerbäck var lugnet själv som vanligt. Being in France now it's absolutely fantastic with these guys so so um, yeah I don't find words for it and it's it's been really fantastic every time I I went to the finals before but this this feels a little bit more special I mean the the warmness and the support we have got from people I met there and and you can feel how proud Iceland are about these guys and and so I can feel it deep in my heart too so of course it's a little bit special if you compare it with but uh, it's it's Ja, ah, det är fantastiskt. Island har väl nästan gått man ur huset för att alla vill åka till Frankrike och se det första mästerskapet som nationen någonsin nått. Och det är Lars Lagerbäck som har tagit dem till mästerskapet. Stjärnan är Eider Gudjonsson. Även om han inte kommer starta så är han på något sätt den största fotbollsspelare som nationen levererat. Och han ser fram emot att åka till Frankrike. Going into the Euros now, were you nervous when the Lars Lagerbäck introduced the squad? No. I was uh, just looking forward to it, excited, uh, but not nervous. Because I, until now, <coughs> I have not had the feeling that my career is incomplete without a Euros or World Championship. But maybe that feeling will change now in the next few days or weeks. They saved your name until last. Did you know that you were in the squad? Or? Yeah, I knew an hour before because the players all received the message whether they were in the squad or not. What was the feeling when you got that message? Uh, it's pride, um, a little bit of relief and excitement at the same time. But you you retired from the national team after the World Cup qualifiers where you almost reached Brazil and you're still here. How come? Yeah, because uh, when I started playing for Bolton again uh, hey, Mir Hatlinson and Lars, they called called me and was asked me how I felt about coming back to the national team uh, because they felt I could still give a lot to to the team and uh, so I decided to do it. How do you look at the Euros? Will you do a Leicester and win? No, we will do in Iceland we don't have to compare ourselves or look at anyone else to inspire us inspiration comes from from within uh, and we should play every game there as we did in the qualifiers and then we will end up where we deserve to end up looking into the group Portugal tough opponent but Austria Hungary looks something you could manage uh, yeah I I think uh, Austria is probably one of the most underrated teams uh, at the Euros at this moment I think they are much stronger than what people think we in Sweden know because they yeah. beat us in you the should qualifiers. know <laughs> so 
Hungary, of course, maybe with full respect, is the one team that we say can be a big chance for us. Everything has to go perfect for us to to achieve something. What's your role in the squad? Are you looking to start or are you...? Ah, oh, Of course, I, I just go in to prepare every game as I would prepare here. Like, prepare like I would be starting. At the end, it's not my decision, it's the decision of the coaches. Uh, but I think it's important for especially the older and the experienced players to try and create a, a good atmosphere because it's a long time together in um, even in the build up and going into France and it's a long time that we spend together a little bit secluded so we have to try and create an atmosphere that uh, everyone feels comfortable and everyone feels that everything is in place just to concentrate on, on the games A lot of Icelandic fans are going there how is that feeling almost maybe 10% of the country is coming to France <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just shows how excited people are in Iceland um, I think it, I mean us as players we're excited the, the, the people in Iceland the, the fans everyone it's uh, it's a unique experience how many questions have you got about tickets not that many because uh, when the tickets went on sale I think everyone was really quick quick to react in Iceland anyway so how do you explain uh, the strides that Iceland has taken this is the first major tournament they reached they were really close in Brazil after not really being close for a long time yeah I think it's uh, deta small details in every department coming together I think the fact uh, that four, four years ago uh, Lars Lagerbeck walked through the door uh, the response was automatic and natural that he had a lot of respect from the first minute uh, he his message to the players is very clear on how we, how he wants to play and how he wants the team to play. The structure is a little bit more professional. I think the, the facilities in Iceland in general have become much better. I think the mentality around the football association has improved. I think the mentality of the players has improved in a sense that we are not playing international games anymore just to be there. We are there to compete. And when you add these small things together, plus the fact that we have a really good generation of players with a mixture of young, uh, experience, quality, strength, that's the reason, if you add all these things. There were talk that you got uh pitches uh, so you could practice year round was that a big factor getting all this generation because we have a lot of Icelandic players in, in Sweden now doing really well yeah I think it's a of course I think it's a big factor and I think the, the players the majority of the players that are in the national team now is sort of the first generation that is benefiting from the facilities they they were probably starting their football when the indoor pitches were being built. So this is the first generation coming through to play for the national team, which is uh, really good, but there's always room for improvement. Is, uh, you see a lot of Icelandic players all over Europe, a lot of them in, in Sweden. Is that one factor that you want to get away from Iceland and play professionally around Europe? Ah, of course, if you have any ambition as a player, you have to leave Iceland. Well, Iceland is just a well, semi-professional, amateur, somewhere between amateur and semi-professional. And if you want to further your career, then uh, you need to have ambitions to play in bigger leagues, bigger stadiums with better players. And the Nordic countries is a good step for Icelandic players because I think they've made 
in the history a very good reputation from the, for, for themselves. Uh, their attitude usually is very, very good. They have this amazing willpower and plus now that the quality is stepping up in Iceland also. So we should try and definitely try and not to lose the, the authenticity of what is being an Icelandic footballer. Icelandic football is not known for its extreme technical ability, even though everyone is improving. Icelandic footballers throughout the years are known for their character, for their never give up attitude. And if you can hold on to that, plus the extra quality that is coming, then you have a good recipe. Coming to uh, Lars Lagerbeck, Swedish, uh, what has he meant for the team? Ah, he's meant a, a great deal. He has uh, taken over the team when he was in a bit of a low point. He uh, inherited a very good squad, a very good uh, moment to take over Iceland, I think. But he has come in with detailed, uh, uh, very... Uh, uh, re- how do you say a lot of rep- repetition in his approach so <clears throat> it is very clear th- th- how we want to play no player goes onto the field without knowing exactly what his, his role is you've had almost all of the best coaches in the world Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho, Claudio Ranieri how do you rank Lars Lagerbeck? <clears throat> Uh, it's difficult to say because, you know, with uh, the coaches that you have at a club level, you see them every day. Uh, you see how they work in a in a longer period, uh, and you see the variation of the trainings. With the Lagerbeck, usually we're together three days, four days maximum. So it's it's difficult to say or to compare him. What he has is something special. Is a presence when he walks in the door that everyone sits up when he walks in, and uh, and one of the best attributes of a coach is is the ones who can get their message over to the players most clearly. He, he definitely does that. Do you think a, a coach that has been very successful at the club level, like Mourinho or Pep Guardiola, could they have done with Iceland what Lagerbeck has done? Ah, it's difficult to say because if I say yes, I'm making it look an easy job. And if I say no, then I'm saying mm, not giving enough credit to the players. Uh, they probably could have, but they didn't. Lars Lagerbeck did. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he, he could have been a, a success in a club in Europe, or is his way of working perfect for the national team? Because he had good results with Sweden too. Yeah, I think his, his and this is just my opinion, his way of working is perfect for a national team. That's not to say he couldn't be successful in a in club football, but uh, from the the time that I've known him, I see him more as a national team coach. In Sweden, people kind of tired of his football because it was not taking any risks, and uh, even though he took Sweden to a lot of championships, people's demands went higher, and they thought kind of. Can you understand that? That you after a while can can tire on that football? Um, yeah, tire. Uh, you just have to play the best you can play with the players that you have. And if you have a method that is working, why would you change? Not uh, Talking about Los Lagerbeck, is there one thing that you could pinpoint that except his presence, because that's kind of a, something concrete that he does or something concrete that he says to you that you should work on this? No, not one thing. 
it's more the the collective. How do you feel now that he's leaving the Icelandic national team? Uh, I feel very thankful and grateful for what he's done for for our country. Mm. And I wish him all the best. That's. I'm probably stopping at, at the same time, so we, <laughs> I'm not that. Uh, I haven't thought about it that far. He's not the person who celebrates that much. I guess when you went to the Euros, he didn't celebrate that much. <laughs> He's a very quiet man. Uh, but I'm sure he was, even though he doesn't show much, he was very happy. And we felt that. And uh, He let the celebrations up to us, the players. And you took care of that? No, not me. I was just one of the players also. We... Uh, had a someone at the football association or took care of whatever we did. How? What is the view of Lars Lagerbeck on Iceland? That he should, be, should become president. And that's not a joke. <laughs> Maybe a little joke, but not. It's not a hundred percent joke. This is how much uh, people have taken to him and respect him. And appreciate him. That's uh, I think that's the best word. He's really appreciated for what he's done. How important was this, considering the crisis Iceland went through after the economic downturn and all that? How important has the football and what you, together with Lagerbeck, done? <clears throat> yeah, it's difficult to say the importance uh, because you have a financial crisis, but one thing. Life goes on, and uh, I think the worst, and this is me just guessing, the worst period is, is finished in Iceland. But in any case, when you have something, when people are going through something, whether it's uh, financially or illness or whatever they're going through in life, if you have some kind of positive distraction that can take your mind off your problems for a little bit, that's very very good thing and I think um, the uh, the national team has now been a very positive distraction from everyday life you almost played with your father who's well known in Sweden after playing for uh, Örebro Arne Gudjonsson you came on as a substitute for him uh, how was that? It was strange. It was a strange feeling. That's a very proud feeling, for a proud moment for us. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit of a bittersweet moment when you think that we should have played together. And we should have played not only one, we should have played maybe ten games together. Why didn't that happen? Uh, because I broke my ankle. Uh, the, 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 it was decided with the football association that they wanted the first game to be in front of the home crowd and in Iceland. Uh, okay, and so we, we played this game and had this substitution, which was a, a historic moment. And I thought a month later or six weeks later we would play together, but. I was unfortunate to break my ankle in the in between. And it never happened because he played for a couple. Uh, of he played two more years, but or eighteen months with the national team. But I could never recover. I was out for almost two years, so that was a difficult time. What has he meant for your career? He was he was played he played in sweden for many years and did really well especially for Örebro and uh, had a great career what did it mean to have a father to be a, such a good footballer yeah I, I looked up to him i looked up to uh, i wanted to be like him and it's uh, it's uh, it wasn't strange for me in any sense it was it was just this is my life. My father is a professional footballer and it's natural to me. So 
it's difficult to explain how it was. It was just normal. And now he's your agent, and I know he was interviewed sometime with uh, in the Swedish newspaper and said that when you were out of a club that it was possible that you would go to Sweden. Has there any been interest from Sweden? I don't know. I uh, really don't know. It was. Uh, I think there might have been some interest when I came from before I, I signed here, but. Nothing that I know of. I, it was a, a very quick decision here when I spoke to Ole Gunnar that it was an easy decision to come here. How is it to have your father as an agent? I, I just see him as, a, as my father. Uh, in recent years, he, uh, he didn't have to do much because I've been in the game myself for such a long time. But of course, when when I was uh, going to Chelsea, moving from Chelsea to Barcelona, after that, in, in that process, he was uh, he was my agent now, and he's always my father. So it's I never see him as an agent. He's maybe lower on the percentage than a regular agent. Yeah, yeah. Looking at Sweden, did you ever come to Sweden and see he, your father play? I never came to a game. I came one. I uh, came to visit him. Um, in in Örebro, but I uh, never saw a game. Now the Blues can try and spread the play out again. Let's go. Great ball through to Good Johnson. Good Johnson's through. Can he finish? Chelsea have the lead back again. Zola. Good Johnson again. He's done it again. Identical to the first goal. Hasselbank. Good run by Good Johnson. Good finish. It's still Frank Lampard. And Lampard spilt. Good Johnson makes the game safe. Jogba. Looking for Ida Gudjonsson. He's got there first. And it's ended up in the back of the net. And Chelsea score. La verticalidad. Iniesta que se frena. El disparo de Iniesta. El palo. El rebote para Gudjonsson. Y gol. Gol, 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 gol del Barça. Marco Gudjonsson. I Sverige känner vi ju mest till hans pappa, Arnold Gudjonsson. Men Eider Gudjonsson har haft en makalös karriär. Han slog igenom i Bolton när de var riktigt bra i slutet på 90-talet och gick sedan till Chelsea där han spelade under både Claudio Ranieri och framförallt José Mourinho. Och sen blev det Barcelona under Pep Guardiola innan det var, blev spel i Monaco, Tottenham, Stoke, Fulham och en del andra klubbar. Ja, och kollar man igenom spelarna han har spelat med så är det inga dåliga namn. Bland annat Lionel Messi och Drogba och Eto'o. Och en hel rad andra lirare. Och ändå är det en annan spelare som han passade bäst ihop med. Your Swedish connection is that you kind of came after Henrik Larsson in Barcelona. And after you, when you left Barcelona, Zlatan Ibrahimovic came to Barcelona. So you never played with any of those. No, I, I, met, uh, I met Zlatan when he signed because I was still at the club. And we spent some time and pre-season together. I think they're both uh, exceptional players uh, in their in their own right. And and Slatan is Slatan is Slatan. Uh, I read an interview with you in four four two where you said that in the beginning, when you played in Barcelona and scored, you have the same number on the jersey as Henrik Larsson. You were kind of coming after him that you, you were kind of part of his legacy before you made your own legacy no I, that, I don't think I, I said that I, I basically that was the feeling that the people had uh, Larsson left I came in from Nordic country I scored on my first game as a substitute and it was the feeling that okay Larsson is gone but we have a player exactly the same and it And with full respect to Henrik Larsson, it's uh, 
uh, I had no problem with it, but it's not nice when people are comparing you because we are completely different players and completely different characters. How how did you uh, f- in Sweden? It's kind of like a enigma that Slatan wasn't really a success in Barcelona, but you adjusted. Can you understand why he didn't really fit into? Yes, I can understand why. Um, because it's a, it is a, a peculiar place. Not peculiar. It's a, a particular place, Barcelona, and they play a certain way, and uh, they have a certain way of uh, behaving uh, around the club, and. I th- think Barcelona, as a football club, didn't match the personality of Slada. That's what I think. Uh, and it's not negative for him or for the club. I just think it wasn't a good fit. But you've uh, experienced Slatan on the side. Are you surprised that he became such a huge uh, player that he became? No. I think uh, from the time that I met him, I think he's a wonderful guy and there's not a a dull moment when you're around him. And the fact that he has made the career that he has is not only because of his incredible ability and his uh, big physique, it's his uh, mental strength and this unbreakable belief in himself that has taken him so far. Looking back to your career, you had some tough injuries, at least one in Greece and also in the beginning in PSV Eindhoven when you had to go back to Iceland. How hard is that to overcome? Yeah, The first one was very difficult because it was such a long time and there was a big question mark whether I could ever play again. So that was tough. The second one, tough in a different sense, because I was 33, I think, yeah, or 32, just turning 33. So it's a different ends of your career. One is when you're starting, and the other one is when you should be finishing, really. Yeah. But I, it also gave me a lot of motivation. The second injury, because I just decided, okay, this is not how I'm going to leave the game, is with an injury. I'm going to stop, I'm going to do everything that I can to stop in the way that I want to stop, not because of of an injury or something else. As a young player, often young players or talents, they want to know how to reach the way all the way you did what what's your advice to a young player coming through 15 16 choosing between different uh, yeah set your goals higher than you think you can reach because uh, anything everything is possible live your life uh, in full dedication to that to your goals I think that's the that's the main thing. You set your goals and you live your life in a way that will help you reach those goals. You came from Iceland, small football nation. You won the Champions League, you won La Liga with Barcelona, Premier League, a lot of titles, a lot of goals. What is the things that you think made you the player and made that career? I think my uh, first self-belief uh, my ability uh, with my feet, but most of all the ability I have here uh, in your head. In my head, because I, I never in my career was I the quickest player or the uh, the most technically gifted. I think the my main strength strength was seeing the game a little bit earlier than everyone else. You played in La Liga, you played in Premier League, Liga. Uh, which is the best league to play in? The best league to play in is the Premier League. 
The best quality is is La Liga, uh, and it's as simple as that. I don't, we don't have to argue. People who say, "Ah, we I would like to see Barcelona play against West Bromwich," or with full respect, uh, Stoke City or West Ham. No, the, these teams have no chance because uh, the level of the top teams is uh, in Spain is incredible. And I think with what we've seen again with Europa League, Sevilla winning, we see now Champions League, uh, three Spanish teams in the semi-finals. That's it speaks for itself. It speaks for itself, yeah. Why is it better to play in the Premier League? Because the excitement, uh, because of the the coverage, and I think, um, and this is only my opinion, because uh, I followed the Premier League since I was a young boy, and I didn't follow La Liga since I was a young boy. I followed Barcelona, but not the league itself. And because we grew up in Iceland, speaking English, watching English football, you feel much closer straight away to the atmosphere when you arrive in England. In Spain it was, of course, you you feel it, but you have to learn the language, you have to adapt your own life, and it takes a lot longer for you to feel integrated than when you're in England. You're one of few players who've had both Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola. What What are the differences and why are not they not really friendly? I don't know why they're not friendly. <laughs> uh, Mourinho is a is a big character, and uh, he really gives you a feeling that if you play to his his standards and what he believes you can do, he loves you like family. With Guardiola is more dis- a little bit more distant, and he's not such a big character. He, uh, Mourinho does not like confrontation. Uh, Mourinho loves confrontation. What Guardiola does. He hides away from it and doesn't want it. But as coaches, I think they're at a similar level because uh, they see the game uh, and they see the details, and they have a very clear view on how they want to play and they they get that across to the players could you choose one and say i would prefer that coach in front of that coach yeah i would choose Mourinho. why because i had a, I had a better relationship with him uh, and he was a, a special in my career when you read the players you've played with, it's like the top of the list. I mean, Ronaldo and Pesce Eindhoven and Lionel Messi, Thierry Henry, Drogba. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've been very fortunate. Um, and it's still, when you said uh, in one interview the best player, it was kind of a surprising player that you fit together with, the play the best with. You said Hasselbank was one. Yeah. Uh, Definitely not the best player. No, I'm, but, but you, you best, fit. The best fit. Yeah. How come? We had something, uh, a natural understanding that we were like two pieces of a puzzle that fit perfectly from the first moment that we met. And it's difficult to explain. And then by playing more with each other, it just became more and more natural. I would, I, I could receive the ball. And al- almost with my eyes closed, I would know where he was. That's the connection that we had. Playing with a lot of top players, you were top player too. Is there one thing that you could see that all of them have? Yeah, they all have a, a, a different ability. Whether that is uh, movement, uh, thinking ability, anticipation of the game... Uh, an instinct, they all have a different instinct and the top players, absolute top, I would say they have something extraordinary even above the really good players, the top players have something just slightly 
slightly more. You've been all the way up to the top and then slowly worked your way a little bit down. How is it to return and play in, or not return, you haven't played in the Norwegian League, but playing in the Norwegian League after Champions League, Premier League, La Liga, suddenly play in Molde? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's just the, the appreciation for the game that I have. I think it's uh, part of the fact that Iceland is going to the Euros uh, and I wanted to be part of it. I honestly think, and this is with full respect to the, the league here and, and the club, that if we were not qualified for the European Championship, I would not be playing uh, in Norway or not even be playing. I don't know. But I still have the desire and I still have the love for the game to go every morning and, and enjoy it. And whether that is here or somewhere else, here has been really good because Ole Gunnar Solsa have been fantastic for me and I felt that I've made an impact as well on the team and it's been a, a really wonderful time. After the Euros, will you quit playing in the club too? Will you hang up your boots for good? No, I don't think so. It's difficult to say because I, I don't know the feeling that I will have after the Euros. Uh, it's not out of the question, but it's uh, definitely not a, a sure thing. I mean, I have a contract here until another 18 months, so I... If you ask me now, then I say I would keep playing. Uh, what will you do whenever you hang up your boots? Will you become a coach? or? Uh, I, I honestly don't know if I would like to be a coach. I have a very strong idea and vision or picture on how I would work. Uh, but... I've been away from my family for such a long time that I couldn't justify going into coaching straight after my career and being away uh, every weekend and not being able to watch my sons play football and spend some time with my daughter. So at this moment, uh, what will I do? The first, the first thing that I will do after I stop is spend time with my children. They l do they live in Barcelona still? Yeah. And so you commute from Molde to Barcelona? Yeah, sometimes. How often are you in Barcelona? Not often. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I saw them uh, a few days ago, last, and it was the last opportunity before uh, the Euros. So it was really nice. Uh, I think since I arrived in February I've seen them maybe twice. You have a son, several sons who play, but one who's 16, 17? Uh, yeah, I just turned 18. 18. Yeah. Do you have an ambition of playing with him like you did with your father? No. Uh, not that I wouldn't like to, but it's not something that is uh, my ambition. Uh, because he's just starting his, his career and first time he play, he's playing in the first team with his team in Iceland and I wouldn't want to go and play in Iceland just to play with my son. Uh, the, the moment that me and my father had was, was nice because it was a natural thing because my father was still playing for the national team and the coach wanted to get me into the first national team also. It's not because of, ah, let's put father and son together, it's because it was the moment was, was natural. If I go now to Iceland and say, yeah, I want to sign for the, my son's team, it's, it's pretty obvious why I would do it. Do you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, I definitely understand. Yeah, yeah. I would it like would be it. more of a construction yeah. just to play, not yeah. because yeah. something natural. So I understand. Uh, you've been an active player in a, in a time when football has become such a huge... It's bigger and bigger, bigger money and everything. Has that taken away anything of the joy of playing? More of an industry. Yeah. 
yeah, I think uh, it hasn't taken away the joy of playing, but it, it you do see the changes in the clubs, and you do see and you do feel that the atmosphere around the football club is now much more business orientated than it used to be. And when it becomes a business, uh, sometimes the the most natural things get put aside just to keep the f the figures keep everyone happy with the figures and that's the only thing uh, I would say it's changing that if figures are starting to dictate the well-being of a football club it's not nice well we have some players Dani Alves talked about this you probably yeah. saw Juan Mata also yeah. that it's kind of even though they make great money it's they think it's kind of like ridiculous money that they're making yeah uh, it has become <laughs> it has gone a little bit crazy in the last few years, definitely. Um, but what can you do as players? I think I think uh, that's the world you live in, and you have to accept it. How is it to still stay level-headed when you maybe come up without that much education, and suddenly you make so much money? I mean, they. If you read about Premier League, they say that's sometimes a problem for young players coming up and making. Yeah, I don't, but I don't think that's a problem just for footballers. I think it's just a problem, or a problem that can be for young people in general who, in, who all of a sudden make a lot of money. I don't think it's particular footballers. I think it's a, it's something that can can happen to anyone. The, also, you're going to have to make your mistakes. Everyone makes their own mistakes and just make sure you don't repeat them. You had a spell with gambling that you've been open with. Is that Was that one part of a problem that comes with that? Uh, I wasn't very open with that. And oh, you weren't? No, it was just a story that was written in the, in the press in England. Okay, so it's not... It wasn't, <laughs> no. It's a long time ago as well, uh. so... But... Uh, Looking at uh, football being more popular, would you like to go somewhere? I know you've been to China. Would you like to go to play in the US or something like that? Or is it pretty much the end that we see now? Uh, no, I would, I would like to play in, in the US. But not only the US. I would like, I think, uh, the way I feel, I would like one adventure. I've had many adventures and I would like an adventure towards the end of my career. Whatever adventure that is, to play somewhere uh, yeah, where not all the focus is because everyone follows the European football and, and somewhere maybe, I don't know, far, far away. But you've been to China. But yeah. That you won't do again. Uh, I pro I'm, I would. It's not a neg it wasn't a negative thing. It, it was more that being in China would not have helped me. I think preparing for the European Championship. Not the quality of training. Uh, of just the, the, in general, being so far away from the family, being so far away from everything, and when you travel for international games and you have to travel for uh, I don't know 20 hours it's difficult okay thank you very much ja det var nära att det aldrig blev någon intervju med Eider Gudjonsson han var tvungen att ge sig av till Island i ett eh, privat ärende och dagen innan jag skulle flyga till Molde så blev den en men eh, Molde hjälpte till att styra upp en annan träff några dagar senare och Eider Gudjonsson släntrar in i pressrummet och jag kan ju förstå att Islands motsvarighet till Slatan som gett många intervjuer inte alltid är mest taggad när det kommer en utländsk intervjuare och kanske vill ställa en del av de givna frågorna som han svarat på många gånger. Men det är utan tvekan så att Lars Lagerbäcks insats för Island har gjort att man ha ett litet extra öga på islänningarna och kanske hoppas att de ska kunna gå långt också ihop med Sverige under EM. Och podden, ja, den ska förhoppningsvis rulla vidare och har spelat in en del avsnitt och 
Vi ska hålla ut till mitten på juli när det är dags för uppehåll och semester och innan dess så blir det förutom Aidan Gudjonsson även en tung tidigare UEFA och FIFA-ledare som är på gång under sommaren och en del annat hoppas jag. Och som vanligt är det Olle Junell Lindberg som har producerat podden och ni kan höra av er med synpunkter till olof.lund.tv4.se eller Twitter Olof Lund eller Instagram Olof Lund. Alltid tacksam för era synpunkter. Tack för den här veckan. <skratt>